Hi, I'm Dr. Jamil Sayaj. And on this podcast, we're going to talk about some deep stuff. I'm here to tell you that you're amazing. And often, the only person who can't see that is you. No matter who you are, what you do, or where you're from, there's greatness in you. Let's talk about it. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Jamil Sayaj and welcome to the Transformation Starts Today podcast where I interview leaders, champions, and high performers from all walks of life as they share their story, the lessons they've learned along the way, and empowering perspectives to help you create an extraordinary life without regret starting today. Today we have with us Belinda Ellsworth. Belinda Ellsworth has been called a trailblazer in the industry of sales training and personal development. She has built three successful businesses over the past 25 years while gaining the prestigious reputation as an international speaker and sales expert. Belinda helps thousands of professionals and entrepreneurs create and execute successful business strategies and systems while still maintaining work-life balance in their lives. Belinda's passion led her to start her popular podcast, Work From Your Happy Place, which was picked up by iHeartRadio in 2021. She loves interviewing other successful entrepreneurs and artists on her podcast so that others can learn from their stories. Her Tuesday tips include solid business practices that will stay with your audience forever while positively impacting their bottom line. Belinda, it is such an honor to have you on the show. Welcome, welcome, welcome. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, It's an honor to be here. I always love participating with others who are you know, looking to serve and and inspire others through stories. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Wonderful. And for those of us joining on YouTube, you, your background is amazing. <laughs> I love that. Oh, You're thank inspired. you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And so let's dive right in. So for our listeners who don't know you yet, they haven't heard your story, can you please share with us who you are, what led you to where you are today, and the challenges you overcome, the lessons you've learned that people can glean from? Sure. So, um, gosh, are we going, are we going way back? Like, I think it helps. I always go way back. (laughs) So, um, when I was in school, um, so two things about that. So one, I just really wanted to be a, um, a a rock and roll star. That was all I wanted to be. (laughs) So I started playing the drums at the age of 10 and I was serious about it. So the reason I bring that up is I was dedicated. And I think that that is an important, um, it was a learning lesson starting from the age of 10. And I practiced every day more than what was even required of me. I, and, and just to give a little bit of that background too, I, I was told when I wanted to play percussion, they were like, oh, well, you didn't score high enough on this test and we're not putting you in. And there were no other girls in the percussion unit at that time. And, uh, and I begged, like I cried and begged and my mom called and begged and, and they said, well, we'll give her a three month trial. And if she can't keep up or can't handle it, then, um, well, she'll have to choose something else like the flute. So, um, (laughs) I was like, okay. And I think that that made me work hard from that. It was like a, okay, I'm, I'm not getting kicked out of here. I'm going to work really, really hard. And that dedication to mastering my craft at even 10, um, is a lesson that I've carried with me throughout my entire career. You have to master your craft. Mm -hmm. You have to get good at what you want to do. You can't settle for mediocre if you really want the success that comes from that. Um, I find a lot of people just don't want to put in the hard work. And, and it is hours of, you know, le- continuing to learn, continuing to be a student. Um, so I've carried that with me kind of my whole life. And the other side of that is, is a young person. I had a very strong entrepreneurial spirit because if my parents said, oh, you can't have that, or, you know, what do you think money grows on trees? I was like, no, I don't think that. <laughs> um, so I'll go earn it. And so I started doing a variety of um entrepreneurial things. Um, like, uh, I mean, I was, I learned to crochet and like, so this is at a young age, like 11. And I would take orders for crocheting these pillow covers and everybody was ordering them and I was making money. And then, um, then I got a paper route. 
um, at like the age of 12. And I, I share this story because I feel like you, again, you have to fight for things that are important to you or that you want. And I thought I'll make a really good um, paper route was a good way that a lot of my friends that were boys were making really good money. And um, I had to literally petition a neighborhood to say, would you accept a paper girl hmm. before they gave me the route? And so um, that's how it was back back then. Like they, there weren't paper girls. And so I, I, I had a paper route and I learned about the way to save money. I learned about um, the way that you treat customers. I built my route to be extensive through referrals. And this is at the age of 12. So I just had a really good sense of you treat people really, really good. You get bigger tips. Um, you ask for referrals. You get um, more clients. Um, you do your job really, really well. And people like you. And then they do refer you to others. So that was the lessons that sort of were formulated. And so as time went on then, you know, I did start playing professionally and it was exciting, but being an artist isn't always easy and there's not always a steady income. So I started doing sales as a sales rep, um, just to make extra income. And I discovered that I was actually very, very good in sales. And, um, when I started my family, um, so fast forward several years, I just decided maybe being a rock star isn't in the cards after all. And I, I probably need to be more home to be with this baby. And so then I, I really pushed all of my attention forward into sales and I became very, very good at it. And I was the, one of the top sales reps with the company and continued to be, and then switched companies and product lines and continued to be the number one salesperson in that company. And um, after 16 years of being very, very proficient in sales and earning a very good income in sales, um, I was encouraged by a couple of motivational speakers. Now, as you are in sales, everybody there wants to know what you're doing. So they would always ask me, hey, can you share? Can you share at this meeting? Can you share at this convention? And we happened to have hired a couple of really well-known motivational speakers. One was out of Disney Corporation and the other one was just a really popular speaker out of Los Angeles at the time. And they actually heard me speak. And this was over a course of six months. Like one of them heard me share at one event and then another one heard me share at another event. And they both said, what are you doing? like here, you're like really talented and you're an outstanding speaker and you should be doing this for a living. So when the first one told me that, I thought like, that's crazy. And, uh, but six months later, I had another person, a very high caliber person tell me that. And the lesson in that is when, when somebody around you is saying, you should really look at this, or have you ever considered this? It's somebody sees something in you that you don't currently see in yourself. And if you're hearing that a couple of times, take notice, take notice. If I hadn't have listened to that, if I had said, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard, or no, I had no desire to be that, or I'm really good over here in sales. I don't need to do that. Um, if I hadn't have listened and really thought, what's that look like? And took a risk and started my own speaking business in 19, at the very tail end of 1995, so really 1996. And um, wow, what a journey that has been for, you know, all those years and gosh, and it took off pretty fast. And, but I would say, what did I do to make that really go fast? I mastered my craft in it. I listened to myself. I recorded myself. I, um, I actually had one of the people in attendance in my seminar. I remember I did this seminar. There was like several hundred people there. Um, I got a standing ovation. People were going crazy. And yet I was checking out of the hotel and this woman came up to me who had been in the class and said, you were really good, but I couldn't hardly stand to listen to you because your voice was so shrill. It was uh, setting off my hearing aid. And so I was like, oh my gosh. And I remember thinking I was felt mortified standing there and I had two choices right then. And we all have choices. I could have either said, oh, give me a break. I could have first said, oh my gosh, I'm horrible and I can't keep doing this. 
Or I could have said, um, oh, that's ridiculous. Is that the only thing you got out of this? Like, you know, didn't you get anything out of my three hours of nuggets? Um, but I didn't do either one of those. I said, okay, and everything that somebody says, there's a there's a grain of, you know, truth. So what is the truth in that? And so I came home and I actually worked on learning. I got a voice coach and I learned to speak more from my diaphragm than from my throat, which is what singers do, right? And I became a better speaker because of that. And so I've had a very successful career in doing that. Um, I've consult, I've, that's turned into consulting. It's turned into many different avenues, but honestly, um, COVID really sort of put a monkey wrench in that. And I had to literally um, start kind of all over um, with, so now it's more about the products and services that I offer people and, um, and I'm not speaking as much live. And in many ways, um, I do more online things like this podcast. I have a podcast now, which I love doing. It's just like, I allowed that room for my, for my life to shift and change. And it wasn't easy and it's not been easy. It was forced, you know, on many of us during COVID changes were forced. And, but I have to say that I'm, I'm, uh, there's been stress involved with it. I've made new decisions. Um, I've questioned myself what I needed to do or wanted to do, but I'm like, it's exciting. And I'm back at like a, a new beginning and doing things different. And I think we, and now I'm learning, I'm taking all kinds of different classes on what I'm doing with the subscription box. And, um, it's fun because guess what? I'm mastering my craft again. And I think every time we're in learning mode, we change, we morph, we grow, we experience, and then we're able to share that with others. So that is my whole entire life from the age of 10 to today in a nutshell. And you can ask me any questions about any of those things you want. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Belinda. It's really, really wonderful. And there's a bunch of little things I wrote down that stood out to me that I think will really serve our listeners based on your story. One is use the word dedication, like being dedicated to mastering your craft. And I think it's so, so important. Very often, I've seen this personally, and I, I'd imagine you have as well. People will have a big goal. They'll look at, let's say, let's say it's financial. And just to put it really out there, they'll see a billionaire and they'll say, I want that. But what they're doing, not realizing it usually is they're falling in love with the outcome, not the process. They're committed to the outcome, but they're not committed to the process of what it takes to get there. And so what you don't see is the decades of work that somebody puts in to create the result. You see somebody who's an Olympian or somebody who's a world champion, you know, fighter or whatever. And people say, oh, right. overnight success. I've been doing this since I was five <laughs> and I'm like 27 right. or 32 or 50 or whatever the age. We don't see what's behind the scenes. And so there's a distinction I'd love to share with our listeners about, are you committed to mastery or are you committed to dabbling? And if you're committed to dabbling, you show up, you try it out, you kind of taste it using the, like the, the metaphor of a pool, you kind of dip your toe in for a little bit, and then you back out, but you never dive in. If you want to learn how to yeah. swim, you're only going to get so far by reading about it. You know? <laughs> you're going to have to jump into the water at some point. And so are you committed to what you actually say that you want? Not just the outcome, but the process of what it'll take, because there's something about like the law of sacrifice, anything that you want will require you to make a sacrifice. There's certain things you're going to have to give up because there's opportunity mm -hmm. costs. If I'm going to do one thing, there's certain things I'm not doing. Going back to that Olympian example, if you're 11, right. say what, like when you were, I think you said 10, you want to be a drummer. If you're, if you're 11 and you say, I want to be an Olympian. All right. What's the sacrifice? You're probably not going out partying and drinking and staying out late on the weekends because you have three practices that day or something like that. So from that space, what's the, what do you want? What's the sacrifice? What's the process going to entail? And are you actually committed to that? And if you are, are you willing to go all in? And your story, and this is um, echoed in mine as well, there's a commitment to, you know, what coach can I hire? What book can I read? What course can I take? How can I actually train and get the skills like developed over mm -hmm. and over mm -hmm. again, put in the repetitions? You go to the gym. Yeah. It's like, I remember it's Arnold Schwarzenegger's biography, his Total Recall book. This yeah. idea of you put in the reps. You go to the gym, you yep. do your bicep curls, whatever you're doing, as the more reps occur, your muscles get stronger over time. 
well, like sales, how many calls did you take you know, from that space? Oh, gosh, yeah. How we get better and better and better. And so those, and then the last one I wrote down to point out the idea of being resourceful versus focusing on resources. If we think that I don't have the resources to get what I want, we're lacking in that moment, the creativity of I can be resourceful and find a way to get it. I love that example yeah. of I think the, the, uh, the paper route and this idea yeah. of I petition the area to let me do this. Very often we hear no and we just crumble. We hear no and we allow it to stop us versus no, no, I want this. I'm going to find yeah. it and I'm not going to let myself be stopped. Yes, absolutely. And um, I have a whole thing around like this commitment, these four pillars, but um, it's just such a big, huge piece of it is being committed. There is no overnight success. And, and people, um, they also look sometimes at where you live or what you do. And they're like, well, they're lucky. There's no luck. <laughs> um, you know, people say all the time, oh, she was in the right place at the right time. And I'm like, no, if you put yourself in enough places, enough times, one of them's going to work out to be right. It's, it's putting yourself out there. It's, it's being involved. It's continuing to work and network. And, um, and that's, that's another whole piece that I train on. We can talk about in a minute if you want to, but um, it, it's just, there is a commitment level dedication. And then there's, there's doing the hard work, the reps, the reps on whatever that is sales calls, um, you know, social media, like, what is it that you want to do that you feel like is going to be beneficial and then continuing to learn all along the way. Um, you know, one of the, one of the guests I just had said, one of the things that she would call it is humility. It's like never thinking I've got all the answers. Like, it, like once you get to that point, you're not going to grow anymore. Um, it's continuing to say, is there another way, you know, uh, wow, you're giving me advice. Like, you know, I always say to people, eat, eat the fish and leave the bones. Like if somebody gives you some really great advice, just because one piece of it wasn't, didn't align with what you do, what part did? Yeah. You know, like when I read a book, sometimes it's a lot of the book is like, I'm useless for me, but you want to know what? One paragraph was an idea that I can go, Hmm, let me, let me try to implement that and see what happens. Um, I've had one idea out of a book completely change the trajectory of my income. Mm, yes. Because you acted on it, right? So it's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, with something you mentioned about luck, you know, the, the definition of luck that I really like, which is luck is when opportunity meets preparation. And so mm -hmm. you mentioned this idea of, oh, someone says, oh, you were just in the right place at the right time. The part they're leaving out is it's, it's not just the right place, the right time. It's the right place, the right time. And you were being the right person. And mm -hmm. when your being shows up and the opportunity is there, that's when the magic happens. But you can be in the right place at the right time. But if you're not ready for it, <laughs> it's going to fall flat right. and, and it's not going to take off at all. Yeah, absolutely. But also, if you didn't show up at 20 other places, you'll never find that right one. You know, it's and and it is all about connecting with others it is about networking it is about um you know having self-confidence and, and, and self-confidence just really comes from knowledge and experience it's experiential knowledge so mm -hmm. i have the knowledge and like you said you can't just keep reading about it you got to get in and swim right and so i've i've got the knowledge then i try it out it might not work the first time and in fact, you might go, this isn't, this isn't good, but you can't try it once. You got to try it again. And then you try it again. And then you tweak it a little, and then you try it again. And then you're like, oh my gosh, it's, mm -hmm. it's going to work. Um, but there is no overnight success. And people look at bands that way. Like they came out of nowhere and had a hit song. No, they didn't. They played, uh, I can tell you, I've done it myself. They played a whole bunch of hole in the wall clubs. <laughs> um before that that happens yeah it's like people think their first cd is the one that they heard but it's like that's their ninth cd <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. so true you mentioned the word confidence and so for our listeners if you're not aware confidence when you break it down it's in latin it's confidere and it means with trust or with intense trust and when somebody you can't fake it it's like why do i have trust 
because I've done it before, because I've tried it, because I keep throwing myself at it over and over again and finding ways to improve and do a little bit better. You know, when we look at the situation and I, and I say, I'm going to throw myself into this over and over and over again, and I'm going to find the ways to improve. Eventually you're going to get good. Whatever you practice at, you get better at. But if you, if you practice finding excuses for why you can't do it, if you practice complaining, that's what you're going to get really good at. If you find, if you practice, there's an, there's a quote, argue for your limitations and you get to keep them. If that's what you're practicing, you get to keep that. But if you're always practicing, how can I put myself out there? How can I take the action? How can I try? How can I improve? And I love in your story, when that person made that comment about your voice and you have the option at that point, how do I want to take that? And you chose, yeah. I learned from this. And then you went and you got vocal lessons and you did all these things. And then you took it as like, you know, um, a learning opportunity, which everything is. And if we do that, yeah. it's like the recipe for success. Absolutely. Because the, the reality of it is, is I, I had good content, but I had never thought about my voice. I had never thought about it from how am I delivering that or how does it sound? And especially when I would get really excited because I listened back to the tapes, I would get pretty high. So it was all coming from right here in my excitement. Like when I was excited and, and trying to make a point, I'd, I'd get really super high. So I learned, I don't have to do that. Like I can get really excited and not go into this shrill high pitched voice. So um, what, what, a, what a great thing. I think that was only the third speech I had done. And uh, it, that could have really been either devastation or I could have blown it off ego. So we we have those two choices and um i just chose to say what can i learn from this yeah and something interesting too for our listeners regardless of what their career is their life you know trajectory is as a speaker your your instrument is your voice yes. but somebody else let's say they're an athlete their instrument is their body whatever your instrument is what are you doing to continue to grow that what are you doing to work yes. on that and if you're not growing it it's not a surprise when you plateau now, given your bio, can you please elaborate on what working from your happy place means to you and how can our listeners do that? Yes. So it's funny. I, I, I guess I can share what it means to me, but I do want to back it up because I've interviewed, gosh, about almost 650 people. And when I first started asking that question, what I've learned is I get one of about five or six answers. Um, always. And every once in a while, I get an outlier that's different. But for the most part, they all fall into that same category. And I just saw that. And I just thought, oh, that kind of is based on that person's personality or whatever. But what I started to learn as I started tracking it, because I thought, I'm going to do a book on all of this, right? So what I learned is it really is dependent on where people are in their journey of what that answer then was. I'll give you an example. Some people, I ask them, what's working from your happy place mean to you? And they're like, it's what I love, what I do, that it doesn't even feel like I'm working when I'm willing to work really, really hard and the day flies by. And that was the premise of why I started the show is like, you really need to love what you do. And I do think that's the first piece of it is like, really loving what you do, but that's at the beginning of that journey. Now, of course, now that carries with you, right? So these are all kind of added on. The second one I hear is freedom and freedom falls into two categories. And so, and this does, does depend on personality a little bit, but the first one is the freedom to schedule my day the way I, way I want to schedule my day, the freedom to um, go to work really hard in the morning, but then pick my kids up for lunch and, and have lunch with them from school or whatever, whatever that is, the freedom to choose how I want to spend my day. So that is a big deal for a lot of people. And that's generally, and the other freedom one is the freedom to work from anywhere I want. So that's a personality thing. I'm, I'm a very much, you know, systems girl. And I like being here. I, I wouldn't be comfortable like grabbing my laptop and going to the coffee shop. I wouldn't even know how to like act there. I'd be like, what? But some people with their personalities, you know, that's that freedom is to choose, take my laptop and I get to work from everywhere I want. If I want to go to Costa Rica for four months and work, I get to. 
If I want to go here and, and work wherever I can. So a lot of that is single people a lot of times versus not always, but people that have families. So that freedom then shows up a little bit differently, right? Depending on where they are. Then as people continue in their career, the next thing that we hear is I'm in my happy place when I'm serving others, when I'm serving others well, when I, when I know that I, you know, I, I, I sold that person something that's going to make a difference for them. I provided this service that I really know is going to make a difference. And then that even continues to change. And then the last one that I hear from people, and they're more in my age bracket, so this is why I would answer that. But I'm answering that for you because all those things are important, right? They're all working from my happy place. But when you get to the latter part of your career, most people will answer it. It's when I know I've made an impact on another human being. When I know that I've left something, a mark, a special, I changed somebody's life in one tiny way that could end up changing a whole entire trajectory of their lives. And that's how I feel. Working from my happy place is when I know that I'm, I'm making an impact on another person's life. When somebody comes to you and says, you know, we were really struggling in the things you taught me. I was able to, we were able to, like my husband lost his job and I was able to carry us alone. And it's because of all the things I learned from you. Um, like, like there's nothing greater than that. Or when someone says, you know, I never thought I could be this, or I didn't have the confidence to do this. And now I'm actually doing this at my job, or now I have this. Um, when you know that you've made an impact, it's truly, it brings a joy that's kind of hard to describe. And that is for me, you know, working from my happy place, of course, is the freedom to be with my family. Um, it's serving others well, like not in a way that is greed. I always say the two things that take people down is ego and greed. And so, you know, I never want to be greedy that I'm selling somebody something that they don't need. And I never want to be, have an ego where I don't think I can learn from somebody that hasn't been doing something as long as I have. I mean, like I want to learn. So for me, it's the, the lasting impact that you have on another individual's life. Yeah, I love, love the answer. And uh, what comes to mind for me is this idea that one of the things I find that virtually everyone is after is living a life that's meaningful. And when we come mm -hmm. from the space of, there are many people who, if we use finances as a metric, they bring in a lot of money, but let's say they feel that void inside. And so they don't mm -hmm. feel like they're making that impact. So even though they have all this money coming in and from the outside in, they have all the stuff and it looks like impressive internally. It's like, I'd give this all away if I could be happy. Like I, I don't feel it. And so if we look at our own life and we ask the question, how to today, don't wait. How could I put a smile on somebody's face? How today could I make a positive impact in the life of at least one person? And, mm -hmm. it's, and it, sometimes it's a smile that you give to the person at the grocery store. Sometimes, uh, I think I mentioned this either to a friend or on a podcast recently, one of the two. Uh, you know, there's a story I heard, this person's walking down the street and the stranger walks by them and they look like they kind of have the weight of the world on their face. And the person just, you know, stopped and talked to the stranger for 30 seconds and then kept walking and then saw the stranger later that day. And the stranger walked up to them and said, I was on my way to commit suicide. And what mm -hmm. you said to me in those 30 seconds stopped me and it turned my day around because I thought nobody cared about me. Yeah. You know, like coming from that space, how could we choose to make an impact, to make a positive difference, not only in the world, but in somebody's world? And it's like, if you can, do that, it, it changes everything. Yeah, I know. Like I said to you, and I, I was I was late to this interview, which I hate being late. I think it's irresponsible, and I think it um is disrespectful and and all the above. I it's not something that I um ever do or take anybody for granted in that way. And um, so to be late for this for me is it had to be a pretty big deal. But when you're in the middle of something and you're working with someone and they're in tears because what you're saying is resonating with them and they're working through it it's like all right 
I'm going to be late for this podcast because I'm, I'm having an incredible impact on this individual in this moment. And that's worth everything right now in this moment. Yeah. 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 You know, there's an expression, be here now, you know, when mm -hmm. you said how you ended that statement, that's worth everything in this moment. I had a friend, might have been a, it might've been a, a cousin of mine, but it was years ago. Um, he said, he made this comment. Oh yeah. Well, whatever he was doing with the job or it was something, I got this opportunity and he goes, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I just looked him in the eyes and I said, everything is. And right. looked at me like the jaw dropped, like, wait, what did you just say? <laughs> and when I said it again and we, and we kind of played with it, everything is a once in a lifetime opportunity. You're never, even if you see that person again, they're not the same person they were when you saw them the first time. That sunset that you're watching isn't the same sunset. Like the cloud formation, everything is different. You're not the same version of you. You only get so many opportunities, right? Only so many days, only so many at bats, metaphorically or literally if you're a baseball player. <laughs> and so from that space, what if you be here now? Nothing's more important than this moment. Nothing's more important than the, than the person right in front of me. You'll make it right. meaningful. You'll bring so much magic to the moment. They'll feel like a richness, a depth. Time will feel like it slows down. And I promise you, Absolutely. your experience of meaning in your life will just feel so wonderful. And so with that being said, and like this goes with, I think, what we were just talking about, many people have, in my, in my experience, a negative association or a connotation around selling. And I find that that association definitely hurts them as it relates to how successful they could be, at least financially. Can you relate, can you uh, expand on how you relate to selling? Oh, gosh, yes. So- Interesting enough, and I agreed with your statement, so I would never pop in and say, oh, I just don't want to agree with that. But it is an, an analogy that is used so often. Um, but the relationship to selling is, and how successful you are with selling is very much related to, connected to the relationship and mindset that you have around money. Mm -hmm. People don't always understand that. And so, you know, there's so many different money myths out there. And one is money can't buy you happiness. And it doesn't mean that if I get this and then I'm going to be happier, that's true in what you said about the house. But like, if you had money, could you be happier? Could you be happy having an ink, a good income? And do you deserve a good income? And the answer is yes, um, because what does happen is not so much, okay, will more money make me happier? Well, probably not. There is a certain level where, but will less money be more stressful for you? Yes. So you can, it's okay to make money it, and it's okay to have a good relationship with money. So I think it starts there. The second really big piece of being a salesperson is to not, I'm not selling to that person. I'm serving that person. Mm -hmm. So whatever product it is that you have, even if it's a frivolous product, okay. Um, it still is, does a person, do they want it or need it? And how can I serve them with it? How can I better serve them in this product? You know, if it's a, a product like jewelry, well, can we bring a little piece of joy to somebody? Can we make them feel better about themselves? Can we help them, you know, maybe complete a look that will be the look that they want for work or for going out? And is it going to make them have a little more piece of confidence? Like, yes. So I think that there is what, how can I serve this person? Another one is uh, with sales is to really sell people what they do need. So the biggest people ask me all the time, what is the number one you know, tip for being a good salesperson? And, I, and I've got 10 that I love, but the number one that has to go at the top of the list is be a good listener. So if you are listening, you will actually hear what they need. And I'll give a really good example. I, I would speak at, a, at an event and then I had several packages that I sold of my programs. And they were really for where people were in their path of their sort of career. 
And so one was like, you know, a little over a hundred dollars, $150. And it was like for somebody that was just starting out in sales and, and they just need to know basics. And then it went all the way up to this $500 package. Well, people would love what I said so much. And they would walk up to the table and go, I want the biggest package. And I would, and I would be happy to take $500 all day long. Right. But instead I, I wasn't because is that serving them well? So I would say, um, okay, I'm glad that, that you feel that you're ready for that, but where are you in your career? How long have you been selling? What is it that you're trying to learn? Um, you know, have you, have you moved into a management or leadership position? Because that's really what the biggest package is all about is learning to, um, inspire and motivate your team and learning how to train your team and learning and learning training techniques instead of just doing techniques. And they would say, oh no, I'm no, I'm nowhere near that. Then let's, why don't we take you back to a one or a two? And is that much less money for me? It is, but I built a loyal following of people that came back again and again. And when I would come out with a new book or new something, they would buy it. Why? Because I never tried to oversell them something they didn't need. So, and you need to be honest with sales. Like if you're selling a product, um, that let's say you're selling a computer and the computer, you know, is $1,200. Let's, we're just making this up. But suddenly that computer in certain places online, maybe it is over here. If you buy it right now, you get, you can buy it for nine, nine, nine you know, $999. So I've heard people say, well, they didn't even know about the sale. So I just sold it to them at the $1,200. I promise you they will learn about the sale. <laughs> so if I'm just honest and said, well, right now we've got a code and you can actually get that for $999. They will say, oh my gosh, thank you so much. And the funny thing about that is I've had people go, well, now I just saved um, $200. So now I really would like to get the blah, blah, blah to add on to that. Like they still end up spending the $1,200 but they got more. So you still made your same commission, but they got more for their dollar. I remember one lady, I actually took her order. And then when I came home, I realized she had added it up incorrectly. And that if she would have gotten the, you know, this bonus thing that she could have actually saved. So I called her up and I said, I just want you to know that you, you overpaid and we can rework your order and we can take it down by this much. And she said, um, okay, well, thank you. And I said, well, you're welcome. And um, she said, you know what? That just gives me more money to get that extra piece I wanted. So I said, okay, fantastic. And she said, you know what? I, I never really refer a lot of my friends to somebody else because I never know how they're, they're gonna treat my friends, but you just gave me the confidence I would be willing to refer you to anyone. Yeah. And that's sales. So, um, you know, you, it, it is also learning to sell from a benefits perspective instead of a descriptive perspective. And that's hard for people. They, they want to say, you know, he, here's this pen and it's red and it uh, writes with a gel ink. It's very smooth. It is blah, 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 blah. And so um, instead, how is this going to benefit you? You know what I mean? Like, you know, sell it from the benefit perspective instead of the descriptive point of view. People even do that with their online courses. They're like, it has this, 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 which is all great. But as a person looking at that ad, it's like, do I need, do I need that? So instead, it's like, are you having problems with this? Do you have challenges with this? Do you ever find yourself feeling like this? Do you want this? This is how this will help you because of, you know what I'm saying? And, and so that, those are all the things around sales. I think when you come from a place of service and you know that you just either brought somebody a tremendous amount of joy, um, you know, like it doesn't have to be like, oh, this is going to help their life. I mean, you might sell them patio furniture that they are so excited about because now they're going to get to sit out on their patio and they're going to get to enjoy lovely evenings with friends and be comfortable and it's really pretty and they like looking at it and it makes them a tremendous amount of joy. Well, that's a happy day. So um, that's sales in a nutshell. Yeah, that's, it's fantastic. And just to add to that, 
I think one of the things that I noticed when I was younger, before I started my business, I was surrounded by all these people and they would say, oh, I'm not a salesperson. And I think the identification is what messes us, messes us, up, messes us up. Anyway, I can't even say that. <laughs> Too many yeses. But the idea that if I recognize everyone is a salesperson, yep. always selling something, whether you're selling an idea, you want people to, you're leading them somewhere. You know, you may think of the most spiritual teachers you can ever imagine, the head of the religions. You could think of a Mother Teresa or a Gandhi. These are the best salespeople in history. <laughs> These are yeah. people who are able to influence millions or billions of people into their cause. And so when you come from that space of service is selling, like you said, an influence is selling. If you're having an influence, you want to sell to your kids on why they should brush their teeth at night. <laughs> why they should be doing certain things. <laughs> exactly, eat their vegetables. And so if we recognize that the only difference between influence and manipulation is your intention. Mm -hmm. Influence is I'm trying to sell you something for your benefit. Even though I win too, it's a win-win. Yes. Manipulation is I'm trying to get you to do something for my interest. Yes. Now at that point, if we look at the any negative connotation we have or association to selling, it's usually, we, we really mean manipulation. Yes. If we can say, wow, actual genuine selling of I've got a problem and somebody has something they can help with that all day, like bring it on. Okay, bring it. <laughs> like I want that. Uh, the next thing I want to bring up is you said something about what are some of the best qualities of a salesperson? And I thought, you know, just genuinely caring, mm -hmm. you know, and you radiate that. And so all these stories that you're telling, you genuinely care. And I think that when people are like, hey, what tip do you have for me to be a great salesperson? If you can be a raving fan of whatever it is that you're selling, there's a level of enthusiasm that is so authentic that just comes radiating out of you yes. because you love it. Some of my clients that would listen to this podcast will probably laugh when they hear this because they know the story. I used to live in Arizona for five years and I'd never had Thai food in my life before going there. I go there for med school. I find this Thai restaurant. Quick shout out. It's called Tasty Thai on Broadway in Tempe. You got to go. <laughs> it's the best Thai restaurant I've ever had in my life. And uh, I got so passionate about this place. I was going there probably two, three times a week. And I would talk to people and they would say, oh, you know, what'd you do today? And I would start talking about this Thai restaurant as if I owned the place. And they right, right. so I got to try this. I got to go to this place. And I've heard that over and over and over again. Now, why? I just really like the place. I'm really, I really enjoy the food. But what if you felt that way about your product, about your service, where you genuinely knew this was the this is the best thing I could ever sell? And if yeah. you're not feeling that way, either find a new thing to sell or find a way to feel that way about it. Yeah. But if you feel that way, it's like the hack. You don't have to learn tonality and all these little sales hacks if you actually love what you're selling, because it's you genuinely do it automatically. <laughs> it's still Absolutely. helpful to learn, but I've definitely found that if you can become a raving fan of whatever it is that you're getting behind, it's so much easier to just put that forward. Well, you said a key word that I use when I do these 10 tips and um, is enthusiasm. Yeah. You have to be enthusiastic about it and not be afraid to be enthusiastic. Like, don't be afraid to be the raving fan of, of your product or service. It's like when people see that, that's what they're attracted to. They're attracted to not just the product, but the passion you have for it. Because mm. if you're that excited about it, it there must be something to this. Yeah. And so it's people, a lot of times in sales, um, I hear that all the time. Well, I'm not a salesperson. Every single person you've sold somebody on something, a movie, a restaurant, an idea, your kids, the things they do, um, anything. And it's because we're trying to help them, right? We're trying to help them, you know, shortcut something or make it easier or enjoy something of, you know, immensely. So, um, yeah, it is just about that enthusiasm and not being afraid to let it out. Some people feel like, oh, I've got to be this professional like person, or they get this persona that they think they need to be. And, and your sheer enthusiasm is what will attract people more than almost anything else. Yeah. At the start of our podcast conversation, you'd mentioned how you would read a book, let's say, and you'd get like one thing from that book that would just change your whole life. And years ago, there was a book that I read. It's called Secrets of the Millionaire Mind by T. Harv Eker. And that book just changed the whole way I viewed money. And I had all these limiting beliefs around finances and money and everything yeah. like that. 
And there's a chapter in there where he talks about what you were just saying. And he says, there's an expression like, don't toot your own horn. And he goes, people who are financially poor, they don't toot their own horn. But people who are really wealthy, they're shouting from the rooftops. Hey, this is what I have to offer. This is how I can help you. This is something that I genuinely have put time in to cultivate and to make as special as I possibly can. Who wants it? And from that space, if you don't toot your own horn, who else is going to? Right. <laughs> In, in that same vein, one of the things that um, I used to ask at the beginning of my podcast, and I still ask this question, I've just learned to rephrase it, um, but I asked, what is something you're really proud of and it, an accomplishment that you're really proud of, or something that's happened in your business that you're really proud of? And people couldn't answer that question. They, they, and I, I was amazed at the struggle of people like, well, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm proud. It's like, why not? Um, and so I've, I've had to learn to rephrase that into, you know, what's a great accomplishment or a pinch me moment. Like you're, I can't believe that this just happened to me, or this is so awesome. And they're able to answer that, but people have a really hard time with, um, being proud about their achievement and they should be proud about it. They should feel satisfaction um, from that. That's not a negative thing to feel. Like somebody said, if if you can't feel um, some pride in that, like who's going to, right? You, you need to feel some pride in your own achievements and toot your own horn and say, yes, I did this. Um, people have a heart, like I have noticed that. Um, like I, when I, even when I said, what's a great accomplishment, people would still would go, oh, and uh, so I changed it to share me, share a pinch me moment. And they, now they're like, it's taken it off of them yeah. and it's put it on to the event. And I it's know. real interesting how that mind shift allows people to share. I think often people want to, their story that they tell themselves is I want to be humble. And this, yeah. is, I think, is a, a shift, a reframe for people. My favorite defin definition of humility is humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. And so it's not bragging if you've done it. If you can right. come from a space of owning who you are, owning the light that you want to enthusiastically shine, because enthusiasm comes from ante theos or en theos. It means the God within. And when you radiate enthusiastically, that's what you're shining. Mm -hmm. And so from that space, it's not, I'm going to dim my shine and play small. I'm going to play as big as I can, but my, out my, uh, my primary orientation, my focus is on other people. How can I help? So it's thinking right. of myself less, but I'm not bringing myself down. <laughs> and so I think when we think that there's something wrong with being proud of an accomplishment, if we think that there's something, you know, braggadocious about, uh, just saying it how it is, you know, I think that is not, um, there's a, there's a quote, something it's by Marianne Williamson. It's a long one. So I'll paraphrase it. But that idea that you dimming your shine so other people don't feel uncomfortable, that's not helping them. And that's not helping you either. That's just keeping everybody playing small. Right. If you, can, if you, if you shine bright and you can inspire other people that they can do it too, the whole world gets better and everyone just one ups each other yeah. in a beautiful, beautiful way. Yeah. Would you share some of the other uh, sales tips that you were talking about? Uh, I'm like, let me see. So like be a good listener, be enthusiastic, um, sell from a benefit versus a um, feature, descriptive, kind of right? Um, you're not selling, you're serving. Like how can I serve others? Um, another one is use testimonials, like, People don't want to hear what you think about it. They want to know how it's impacted somebody else. So use testimonials. Um, ooh, uh, and I'm like falling on them. So I should know them all off the top of my head, but I don't. Um, okay. But the last one is, um, this is part of sales and people do not equate it to sales. And that is do good customer follow through. So good customer care. Like I want to keep, now you're my customer. I would really like to really take care of you and be, I want you to be my customer for life if you can be, right? Um, and so people don't follow up. They they really don't. Like, you know, I, I, I've taught follow-up for years and 
Oh, and the other one uh, is ask for referrals and people don't ask for referrals. So those are the two at the, at the latter end of the sales. The first, first ones are all about selling. And then this, the, the latter part is how do you grow and how do you get more customers and having a referral program or a loyalty program. Like if you continue to buy from me, you'll get this discount or you will get this or whatever, like, or, or maybe it is just, you know, um, give me a referral and I'll give you X. And I've walked into companies and literally put a referral program into place and, and they see instant change, like almost immediately, you know, and if you do a really good job, this is kind of why it's at the latter end of that, people want to refer you to others, but then it, that also comes from, you know, it's the whole no like and trust factor. But like when you can hit that, when people know you and like you and trust you, that's when the referral kicks in. They're willing, like you said, now they've had this awesome experience that you want to go tell everybody else that that restaurant's amazing yeah. because you'd love them to have that experience as well. But that came from going there. Obviously they had good food. The service was probably really great. They probably, as they got to know you, made you even feel welcome when you came in there. So they created all of that, you know, like and trust factor that you were willing to tell everybody about how great that that was. So good follow through and, and referrals and, um, and doing all those things is at the back end of it. Like call your customer up. How you doing? Um, you know, how have you been? And it doesn't have to be about, do you need anything right now? It's like, Hey, just wanted to call and talk to you in a really long time. What's been going on in your life? I call up people like that right now and they go, Oh, things are good, Belinda. And, um, how have you been? And then we chat and then they're like, it's kind of funny. You're calling today. Cause I was just thinking about blah, blah, blah. Well, okay. Um, so then you end up sometimes making a sale and guess what? Sometimes you don't make a sale. But sometimes at the end of the call, they say, well, it was really great catching up with you. You know, my friend, Susan, she's actually been talking to me about whatever. I'd love to introduce the two of you. I would be thrilled with that. Thank you so much. So then I end up getting an introduction to somebody like, um, so follow up is key. Like that's the last of the sales tips. No, they're, they're fantastic. And one thing that you talked about, I think is so crucial. And I see people fall short on this so often business owners if people who are listening right now, if you just applied this, I think it would change your whole business. What is the customer experience and journey once they come on board and enter into your world? And what does that look like? And if you haven't mapped that out and the moment they come on board, you shift into, let me go find new people. You're not going to retain any of the people you have. <laughs> and so if you bring people in, you spent all this time and energy to find these people and to bring them in. Now, what are you doing to cultivate? What are you doing to share that love? What are you doing to help them feel, oh my gosh, when this person's in my life, things are so much better. Yes. And if, if you do that, so much can change in a positive way. Oh my gosh. Um, funny story. Like for a really brief time, I, I, I went in and I, it was a, a really good friend and they said, oh gosh, struggling with this. They own this computer business. And this was back in the days when, you know, not the way it is today. Like people were like, actually like just starting to use computers and didn't even know where to go or, and, and they were actually building them kind of like a Dell, like back in the day. And, um, and I didn't know anything about computers, but I was really good in sales. So I walked in the door and I was just like, okay, tell me what each one of these are used for. Who needs this computer? Like not, I don't need to know about Ram and all this other stuff. Just like, who's going to use this. So I wrote down who would need that. Um, and then I said, okay, we're going to implement a referral program. So if anybody does come in and buy a computer, cause they were expensive. Um, you know, if they refer somebody to you, we're going to give them this $50 dinner certificate. And so I remember him going, oh gosh, oh, that's like, that's like a lot. And I said, how much are you going to make on this computer? It was like $3,200 or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, and so it was like, it's $50 dinner certificate and it's a, somebody that would never walk into your store otherwise. So then I said, okay, and here's what we're going to do. Anybody that's bought more than one computer from you or two or more, we're going to go, let's go through the list and see if we can find like 10 people that are just, have been really good, awesome people with you. And we're going to send them the certificate just for nothing. Well, I thought he was going to lose it on that one. Like what? 
And I said, just trust me on this. Like, we're going to say, thank you for being a loyal customer. We appreciate you so much. Enjoy this dinner certificate. Well, he fought me on that hardcore till he finally, I said, let's just do 10, like 10 of these. So we did. And the very first call that we got and was a gentleman that said, oh man, I got that, got your dinner certificate in the mail today. That was awesome. And, and it was like, well, well, thanks. And he's like, yeah, I, my wife and I love going to that restaurant. Fantastic. He said, yeah, I was just talking to a buddy of mine over at GM and they're needing to order 20 new computers. And I called him and told him about you and, uh, and he wants to meet with you. Okay. So now out of a $50 certificate, we just got an account with General Motors for 20 new computers. Um, and you can say, well, that never happens, but you know what? Yes, it does. And it did. And his business took a completely different trajectory. I was only there for about two months to help him sort of get on that path. But by training a few of the salespeople there and by putting, implementing that referral program, his business changed. The story is amazing, especially because it highlights something that you, you used that you said this too. People would come back with, yeah, but you know, maybe that's rare. It doesn't have to happen often. Because in that example, $500 was spent and around $60,000 was made if there's 20. 50. Yeah, oh, 500, 30, 200, uh, yeah. Whole 500. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So it's like $500 spent and you made 60,000 ish on the other end. Right. Even if it only happened once or twice for every round of 10 that you send out, that's fine. <laughs> this is amazing. Right. <laughs> that's exactly right. And, and people are, that's a scarcity mindset. And that goes into, we can look at that in all areas of life, right? You either have an abundancy mindset or a scarcity mindset. And, oh, well, I don't need to spend that money or isn't that kind of a waste? That's just a scarcity mindset of what the possibilities really are. Yeah, there's a distinction that I make between cost and value. Cost is what you spend. Value is what you get. And so if you look at what you're actually receiving in this example with the $50 thing is a no brainer on what the back end is. If they buy one thing themselves, it pays it back. But if they refer anybody that pays it back and then some, and it keeps expanding from there. Yep. Could you share you with know, us? Oh, please, it's funny, funny enough, my dad, um, who isn't alive anymore, but he would use the same car dealer, like a uh, salesman for gosh, 40, maybe 50 years, right? I mean, seriously. And back in the beginning of the day, they used to give him uh, this $25 um, coupon, you know, gift certificate or whatever, um, every time he would refer somebody. Well, he referred everybody there and he would always, oh, you need to go there. And he, you know, was so excited to get his $25. Well, as time went on, they quit that program, but my dad still continued to refer people there. He was referring people there to him till he died as he's dying you know he's like this guy calls up and said do you mind if i come and he came and and spent that time with my dad asked my dad if he could pray with him and um like my dad was so thrilled when he came and I, and that's a that's a relationship that was started over a 25 dollar gift coupon that ended up into a 50 year you know, probably more like 40 year relationship. And then here's this guy that, you know, spent in my lad's last 48 hours of his life that he had with us, um, that that was an appreciation on both sides of that, that I'll never forget. Like it was extremely, extremely um, heartwarming. And they had a relationship of that caliber from selling a car to him some 40 years ago. It speaks to what we talked about earlier, making an impact. Yeah. You know, making a meaningful difference in people's lives. Even if we're not directly reciprocated in like a financial sense, there's an emotional heartfelt yes. reciprocation of making that impact, helping people. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. Love that. Um, I often find that people think they're being very, very productive when they're actually just being busy. And they don't have the results that they would like to be having in their life. Have you seen that? And if so, can you speak to that? Um, can you rephrase that again? Can you ask yeah. that question again? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people seem to be very busy 
but -hmm. they think they're being productive. So they think that they're creating all these amazing things. I'm so busy, but they don't have the result. Yes, I absolutely can speak to that. So um, it's one of the things I, I, I teach all the time. Are you busy or are you productive? Mm. Um, people like to make lists of things to do and people feel, and what they're really choosing to do is to make the list to appear that they got things done or, and they're things that don't matter. Like they'll, you know, men and women are a little bit different. Men will make this list. Women will fill up a whole sheet of paper just because I, we can't. (laughs) <laughs> and um, it's, it's like, it's the best when I fill up the whole paper. So I try to teach people the limit. I, I even actually have little post-it things that are only 10 lines. Like you can only put 10, that makes you start to prioritize. And then I really start, started teaching, you know, the one, the main thing, like, here's my goal. And so what have you done today to get to, to your goal? You can have done 20 other things that helped you feel busy and you got to check off of a list. But did they get you to the main thing is the main thing is the main thing. Like, here's my goal. What did I do today to get me to my goal? That's what I ask myself every day. And I encourage my listeners to listen to that. What did I do today to get me to my goal? If the answer is zero, then you didn't have a productive day. Yeah. You need to do one thing. I don't care if it's one thing. What's the one thing I did to get me to that goal? If you did more than one, that's great. And sometimes we have to do tasks, you know, there are tasks and then there are, there's productivity, right? And sometimes we have to do tasks. We have to file sometimes. We, we have to clean our desk off sometimes. We have to, you know, do other things. But like, but did you do all of that in place of the one thing? The main thing, that's the main thing, that's the main thing. And that, if you can ask yourself that every day, then, then you'll be doing okay. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if you're making that progress, even if it's 1% every day, that compounds. <laughs> and when you look at six months, a year, five years down the line, your business, your life, your health, your physical body, whatever it is, is completely different. Yes. But if you're just so busy, uh, one of my mentors jokingly says, most people are too busy to be successful. <laughs> it's so true because they won't, you know, it goes down to focus. I teach these four pillars of success and they are focus. Um, you have to be focused. And that's that piece of that. Like, what have I done? If I really want this to happen, what have I focused on? The second one is committed. You have to be committed to what you want to do or what you want to achieve. But the third piece is that one that isn't sexy at all. And that's consistent. You have to be consistent. You have to show up every day and do the same thing sometimes again and again and again. Um, And then the last one, nobody wants to hear and that is you, you, you need to be organized because people say to me all the time, and I'm sure you've heard this, like if, if one thing, what do you wish you had more of? It, it's not money. What's the one thing? What's the one thing people always wish they had more of? Time. Time. It's the number one answer. And you hear it over and over and over. And the, the truth of it is, is The lack of organization costs you more time than any other single thing. Yeah. Because if you were organized and you could put your hands on something, you could actually make a call in 15 minutes, but people spend 45 minutes hunting for the number. Um, They spend, you know, an hour hunting, even in your closet, like you're getting ready to go out. I want to wear that, those black pants, my favorite black pants. It's like, Where are they? Well, if your closet was organized in a way that you could put your hands on them, then you'd save a whole bunch of time and then you wouldn't be late and then you wouldn't be frustrated and then you wouldn't be stressed. Organization, even though it doesn't sound fun or anything, uh, it is the thing that saves you more time than any other single thing. So if you could get that time back, but just by being a little bit more organized, then wow. Wouldn't that be worth it? Yeah. You know, when we started our conversation, we talked about dedication, mastery, things like that. And then now talking about organization, there's an expression, discipline equals freedom. And if we come from a space of I'm going to be hyper-focused on the things that matter most, I'm going to be structured. That's going to create all the results that I want. And I'm probably going to be so effective and efficient that I'm going to get it done early. (laughs) I'll have free time. But if you're distracted, and you're kind of, your energy is dispersed all over the place. 
you know, I, I use this metaphor of the magnifying glass on the blade of grass with the sunlight. Yes. It hones the sunlight in and you can start a fire with that because it's condensed in one right. spot. But if you don't have that, it's just hot, but the, the heat is dispersed. There's no fire going on at that point. And so in that same way, if you use it as a metaphor of your business, your success, your results, you want to take the focus of your mind and laser it in on one yes. thing. And if you do that, you move mountains. It's amazing. Yeah. It, and, it, it truly is amazing. I know that you have a triangle approach to achieving vision. Can we talk about that? Yes. It's my favorite. Um, Perfect. <laughs> it, it really is, you know, it, it goes back to that discipline and, and then that sacrifice you were talking about. And so my daughter has, she's 19 now. And, um, but she has been acting since she was five. She started acting when she was five. She's done, you know, I can't even tell you how many musical shows she's been in and professional ones. And she's done commercials and variety of other things. And now she's going to college for that. But when she was little, um, she was driving the bus on it, right? But she had rehearsals all the time. So people would invite her to a variety of things. And um, she would say, I can't, I have, re I have rehearsal. And, um, but she never felt like, like she will say today, I didn't miss out on anything. Like I still, I still saw my friends. I just had to make time for them. Yeah, I missed a few parties along the way and birthday parties and sleepovers along the way but look what I gained and look where I am and look how further ahead I am than like even the people that she's going to college with. And she said it, it was a trade, but I don't feel like I missed out. I didn't miss out on anything. And I even had adults going, wow, she doesn't even have time to be a kid. Yeah, she does. Um, and she's choosing to do that. But we, we bought her a, a t-shirt that said, I can't, I have rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> because that was her one line. But going back to that, this is where I started. The reason I shared that story with you is it fit that. But um, like, she doesn't look as like she missed out on life. Yeah, she did sacrifice a few things along the way, but she still had fun. She still saw her friends. And guess what? She's got an amazing career ahead of her because she's followed that passion. But I started this whole triangle approach with her and when she was young and then, and then just really developed it into teaching it to a lot of people. So it, it's a triangle. So think of a triangle and those three points on in either side of that triangle, and then think about the space in the middle. So at the top of that triangle is mastering your craft. You have to get good at what you do if you want to really excel in that. You have to do it again and again you know, the 10,000 repetitions, right? It's, you do it and you'll get better it, 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 with anything. And so, and you can't get to a point where you believe you've mastered it for like an, a lot of artists. I mean, there's a lot of really famous people that still take an acting class or a technique. They still take, they still have a vocal coach. They still um, are taking dance classes just to keep themselves you know, in the know and limber, even as they get a, a little bit older, they want to stay um, in that space. So you have to not feel like, oh, I've arrived. It's continuing to, to do master that craft. The second point on the triangle is work ethic. And that is the dedication that is showing up there's two sides to work ethic. There is the sort of logistics of it, like showing up, putting the work in, doing the practicing, you know, being consistent, making the calls. That's work ethic. But there's also work ethic of being kind and being honest and being compassionate. Like, I can't tell you how many directors have said to me, um, your daughter would just follow direction so well and was so kind to the other cast members, I would hire her again in a minute. Like they, they didn't want to just hire her because she was talented. They wanted to hire her again because she was kind and she always followed the directions. Um, there was no ego that was involved. Like, well, I know better, right? Like they said, your daughter follows direction better than most adults that I work with. Like, it's quite amazing. So that's the work ethic piece of it. 
Um, and then the third piece of that triangle, which so many people just don't really put a lot of value in is, you know, networking or connecting. It's the connections. Um, and it's really, really working that like I, I even for this year in January for myself, because I'm kind of starting a whole new thing and, and it's different. I said, okay, I need to go back to what I might've done 20 years ago. So I made a commitment to make three connect calls a day to people I did not know, whether that was reaching out to them on LinkedIn or meeting somebody through somebody that said, you should meet so-and-so, but I'm going to make three connect calls a day. I did that every single day for 31 days in January and my business completely blew up. Like, and so you meet somebody like, and, and you can trace it. Like I met that person was a very chance meeting but I met them and they introduced me to so-and-so who introduced me to so-and-so. And now they're my lifelong partner in this business or, or best friend that you have or whatever. So it's connections. It's being connected so that other people will say, you know, who's really good at that? Or, you know, who's really does a great job with that. You should connect with them. You want to be that person. And if you're not, you, if you want somebody to do that for you, you have to be that person who's doing it for other people. It works both ways. Connections work both ways. And then the third piece of it then is the middle. And that is the belief in yourself. And you have to believe in yourself. And if that comes from, guess what that comes from? The confidence of mastering your craft. It comes from what? Working hard and people seeing that and, and also believing in you. It comes from connections and um, you know, people telling you, wow, you do a really good job and this is amazing. Um, and then that continues to what bolster that belief that you have in yourself and what you're doing. And so they all kind of work hand in hand, but that is that three, I call it the three sides. I was calling it the triangle approach of that to me. So it sounded ridiculous, but I couldn't think of anything else. And so I put triangle approach to success and put my three things in there and chat GPT spit out three sides of excellence. <laughs> so I've decided, all right, I'll go with chat GPT on that. <laughs> Will you do the three sides of excellence? <laughs> I love the way that you share your story of your daughter as you relay this information and that idea of the shirt, you know, I can't, I have rehearsal. It's just a testament to when a person knows what matters most to them, that's top priority. And the thing is the priority it's an interesting word because it literally means the most important thing. And we can't have multiple priorities. It's not a plural right. word. In English, we do it. But the thing is that it, you know, if you have, there, there's that Gary Keller book, The One Thing. And he says yes. in, the, in the opening page, it's like a quote, if you chase two rabbits, you don't catch either one. Right. And it's this idea, what is your priority? And when you know what's the most important thing, all your behavior, you can choose to map to that or not. And then that can, that'll create the results that you have. So as we wrap up here, the last few questions, would love to get your take on this. So the foundation of this podcast of my work is to help people create an extraordinary life without regret. If people were saying, Belinda, how do I do that? How do I have a life like that? What would you share with them? Oof, I would say um, to have a life without regret is um, do it scared anyway. Like the greatest thing that holds people back is fear, the fear of failure, the fear of what other people think, the fear of what somebody might say. Um, nobody really cares. Nobody's really watching you. And if they, whatever they do have to say, doesn't matter anyway. And, um, and there is no failure. There's only, you know, benchmarks along the road of success. And yeah, sometimes like in life, if you're traveling along, if you think of a GPS, even when you're using a GPS, you make wrong turns. And the GPS doesn't say, you know, the GPS says, you know, reroute, redirect. It doesn't say you're a loser, go home. Like, <laughs> uh, like we're always, we're always going to make wrong turns and, and have detours and bumps in the road. And, but you gotta, you just gotta do it scared. Anyway, you gotta say, okay, I'm, I'm getting in the car and I'm going to go on this journey. And guess what? You, you run into a detour, you go around the detour, you follow the sign. If you run a bump in the road, you fix your flat tire, like whatever might happen along that journey, there's benchmarks and you're never, 
you either go somewhere on an adventure or you're going to stay sitting in your driveway yeah. and you're going to not, you're going to miss out on a whole lot. And so I would say to people is do it scared anyway. Um, and then I would say, find something that like makes you excited, like that you're passionate about. And sometimes it's like you do something and it might be even writing it down. It might be um, like you're thinking of work so hard or a career, but like sometimes they really tell people like an exercise is even go back to when you were a kid and like, what made you happy or like what made, brings you joy right now? And people have started, well, I love gardening. Well, then they've started a whole business around gardening, right? Or I really loved this when I was a kid, like, oh, and you know what? I should start a business with X. It's like search and allow. And that's the other one is like, a big thing about being successful is allow yourself to dream and dream big. Spend time in your day to be a daydreamer. Dream about the craziest possibility that could happen. You know, I used to just sit and dream that I was going to get to play with Bob Seger. And so I just used to think I need to be ready because what what would happen? Like I would envision myself and I would be in the audience and then his drummer, something would happen and I would save the day and, or I was going to meet him somewhere and I would have all these daydreams. I would just daydream about this all the time. And guess what? I never got to meet Bob Seger. It still could happen, but it made me a better drummer because I would always practice. Like, what if I, what if tomorrow he showed up and, and my opportunity, like my daydream came true. Um, and it's just funny. So allow yourself to daydream big. So the, the four things that successful people have in common is they daydream big. Like they have big vision, big dreams, audacious ones. And, and even if that doesn't happen, something else is going to happen. That's going to be like somewhere around that or close. The second one is they set goals. Um, and so you have to have goals and people are afraid to set goals. Like I've got a whole statistics around goal setting that are mind blowing, but like, you can't be afraid to set a goal. doesn't mean if you don't hit it, that you haven't failed. It's a benchmark. Um, the third one is you have to have a healthy, positive attitude. And the thing that can help you have a positive attitude more than anything else is keeping a gratitude journal. Be grateful every day for what you have. And that will help you to stay in a positive frame of mind. Um, and now that I'm sitting here going over the four, I'm like, what is number four? I don't even know, but that's enough for your people yeah. to like live a life of purpose. So <laughs> no, it's a fantastic answer. And when you said do it scared anyway, yeah, I remember hearing Les Brown say something like start as you are, where you are with what you have. And it's like coming from that space. of like you said, I can go on the adventure or I can just wait in my driveway. It's never going to be perfect. There's always going to be stuff that comes up you get to decide, am I going to make it happen anyway? Or am I just going to wait for this theoretical per perfect moment that's never going to happen? And when you come from that space and you don't let yourself be stopped, your life gets to be that adventure. And so if our conversation today, Belinda, was your last opportunity to share your message with the world, what would you want to make sure you leave them with? Oh, gosh. You know, I just, there's so, I, I guess I would leave them with, don't think it's already been done. Don't compare yourself to others. Whatever is unique that you want to do, like find a way that that's that that fourth one is 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 have a plan. You know, I I interviewed a woman that had been a mentor of mine when she was a hundred years old. I interviewed her for her hundredth birthday, and she lived to a hundred and one and worked up until the day before she she died. And um, I said to her, you know, have you ever considered retiring? She said, oh, what would I retire from? There's too many people to love on. Like, there's too much things that can still happen. There's too many people I get to affect. And I would just say to people is, um, there's enough to go around for everybody. Like, people get into that scarcity mindset. I hear people all the time, well, yeah, that's already been done. There's already a lot of people out there doing it. Well, you get to do it in your own unique way. And there's going to be somebody out there that is going to want that. And then the better that you get at it, more people are going to want that. And so I just, that's what I would leave them with is, you know, don't be concerned that maybe that, you know, products already been done or that 
that service has already been done or there's already people out there doing it because that's the thing I hear that holds people back a lot or I'm not really sure how to do it. Gosh, so many resources at your fingertips. Um, there really truly is. So I would say don't, don't get into the compare game um, and don't think that what you have to offer isn't worthy because if you really are passionate about it and you feel strongly about it, then it is. That's such a phenomenal uh, way to wrap this up. You know, there are other people doing anything you want to do, and there are people in the world who will only receive it from you. And so if we allow ourselves to say, you know what, there's, you know, I remember hearing I was in med school and I had known about Tony Robbins since I was 15 and he was like a big deal in my mind. And then I met all these people who'd never heard of him. And I sat there thinking, <laughs> how have you never heard of this guy? And it was like, oh, wow. Yeah, you could be literally impacting maybe a billion plus people and still no one knows who you are. There's some there's people who don't know who you are. And That's yet right. there's people who would love to work with you, the listener, and not work with somebody who may be famous. That's right. And if we come from that space that so there's some medicine on your heart to give to the world and only you can give that to the right people. And so, Belinda, thank you so much for taking the time to share your expertise, your heart, your wisdom today. How can our listeners connect with you, learn more about you, work with you, et cetera? Sure. So they can go to workfromyourhappyplace.com. And uh, that is also the name of our podcast. So I would love them to listen, follow, subscribe to the podcast because we, just like you, um, interview really inspiring people um, every week. And uh, we do artists and we do um, entrepreneurs um, business. So they get both sides of that, the creative mind and then that left side, right side of the brain. So um, I would love for them to check that out. And if they go to our um, website, we just recently started a subscription box and community group where you can learn, grow, and um, it's got so many wonderful benefits in it. But really at the end of the day, if they've ever wanted to start a business, thinking about starting a business, really just want to grow in confidence, um, that's what we're helping people do. And we're helping them with those different resources um, so that they don't have to wear all the hats. They can you know, learn how they how to build a website. They can learn social media. So we're, we're offering all of that. Plus um, quarterly, they get this wonderful box of happiness of simple pleasures in life to make them happy and make working from home more pleasurable. So I'd love for them to check that out. I feel like a, a, a possible name for the episode, you know, a wonderful box of happiness. <laughs> There's a, you've absolutely radiated that throughout our conversation today. And for our audience, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today with us. I believe you know your attention is one of the most valuable assets you have, and I don't take it lightly that you're here with us today. I hope that this served you. I ask that if it did, please leave a, a testimonial, a review, wherever you're listening to this. It goes a long way, helps the algorithm, helps other people find the show so that their life can be benefited and share it. Share it with at least one person who you think you would benefit. Go through it again. There's probably not, you're not the same person at the end that you were in the beginning. So you That's go through it again, and pick up some new uh, nuggets of wisdom from either of us. And so Belinda, before we wrap up, anything you'd like to share? No, just thank you. Thank you for what you're doing and the impact you're making. Thank you for enjoy inviting me along in this journey to share with your audience. And um, I just really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I received that fully. And so as we wrap up here, I said in the beginning, you know, my life's purpose, the purpose of my work is to help people create an extraordinary life without regret to experience the happiness, the peace, the, the fulfillment that they're always looking for. If you're going through any challenging times right now, or if you have some goals in your dreams and dreams that you think are maybe five, 10 years out, and you want to actually make them real within a year or so, I'd love to have a conversation with you. You can book that at jamilsayage.com. As it relates to the podcast, obviously you're here, wherever you're tuning in from, there's so many other wonderful conversations to be digested and consumed and then acted upon. So please continue to do that. And I've made content on social media for about five, six years now. I think I just crossed a thousand posts <laughs> as of different videos, things of that nature that are short, concise, but they're, they're hard hitting and they will shift the trajectory of your day. You can find that on Instagram at Dr. Jamil Sayaj, DR and then my name and Facebook and LinkedIn just at Jamil Sayaj. I call this podcast Transformation Starts Today because I find that most people's favorite day to change their life is tomorrow. And that's why they stay stuck. But you can be different. You can take everything you've heard from our conversation today and apply it to your life and things will change so quickly. You'll be so happy you did. 
Sending you all so much love and looking forward to the next time we connect. Take care. Thank you for being with us today. If this conversation served you, it would mean a lot if you left a review and shared this with anyone who may benefit. An extraordinary life without regret is available to you now. Choose it. It's your time.